When our committee talked about today's program, uh, we decided to change it up a bit and uh, ask Lee Caps to help us present the materials. Lee is one of the founding partners of a talented consulting and coaching group called Clear Space. And Lee has worked with me personally and my entire team at Galvin Company consecutively over the last eight years. Um, and we have always had enlightening and enjoyable experiences together. So, you know, and I also know that some of you have worked with Lee or some of his partners in the past. So we asked him to come and help us here, and he has graciously offered his time and expertise to us for the opportunity to meet more crew members. So without further ado, I think that we are about to have some engaging uh, conversation with a very great facilitator, a delightful person, and uh, we're going to learn a little bit more about okay. strategic acting and developing a strategic team. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Paula. Yeah. I appreciate that, and uh, also I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Um, I, I hope that today is a bit conversational. I will be presenting quite a bit, but also be asking for your feedback so that we can have sort of a large group conversation and maybe even some opportunities to get with your sharing partner around aspects of what we're doing. So, how many people were here in June for the strategic thinking session? A few, okay. Well, this session builds on it, as Mary said. Uh, we, we went from strategic thinking, which is really around, as a strategic leader, really being responsible for your mindset, and how you're anticipating the future and planning for the future. And once that's done, it's about acting. So today's session is gonna be, notice there's two parts to the title, strategic acting, developing a strategic team. And honestly, as a, as a design team, we wanted both. So we're gonna start with this strategic acting and then how do we get work done through others, right? So we're gonna kind of then segue into how do we get work done in a team and what does it mean for you as a leader of a team? So who in the room sees themselves as the leader of a team? You could just show. Okay, most people. Who sees themselves as a member of a team? Everyone. Okay, good. So really be looking at it from that perspective. Just to Re revisit some of the context when we say strategic leadership. And by the way, the much of what we do in today's session is coming from sort of the core source book that's being used for the series, Becoming a Strategic Leader. So we're going to get at least an eyedropper full today. And if you would like more, the, uh, some of what we do today is cited in the book and uh, a whole lot more detail than we can cover today. You also, by the way, have a, a workbook. Uh, some of it is just reference for you to have and take notes on. And one or two pages, we, I will actually invite you to do some thinking and complete them. So what we mean by strategic leadership is leadership that focuses on the enduring performance and potential of an organization so that it will thrive in the long term. Now, each of us, I don't know about you all, but... I hear the word strategic a lot. What do people use the word strategic to mean? This is where I, this is like call and response now. <laughs> what do people use the word strategic to mean? Marilyn. Big picture. Big picture. Planning. 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 Thoughtful action. Thoughtful, Thoughtful action. Overview, overview kind of high term. level. Yeah. I honestly hear people use the word almost synonymous with important. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is really strategic. Mm -hmm. Well, by strategic, we really do mean keeping that long-term perspective and keeping our thinking and our actions aligned with that. So, um, when, what's it look like is when individuals and teams are demonstrating strategic leadership when they think, they act, and then they influence. You can almost think about it as the thinking is, I'm going to take care of myself. The acting is how I engage with others. The influence is how I move the rest of the organization. And the influence, as Mary said, will be the next topic in December. 
but we do it in ways that promote sustainable competitive advantage for the organization and again over the long term. So we have thinking, acting, and influencing. And today we're going to focus primarily on acting. So in the book, and um, this is also in your workbook, when we talk about strategic acting, the book identifies three primary focus areas. One is acting decisively in the face of uncertainty. So being willing to take action in the face of uncertainty. Let me just ask, is there any uncertainty in the world? <laughs> so, Paul, yeah. Paul always, we were talking about Florida and the friends, family, and enterprises that you are part of in Florida, right? So, so is anybody familiar with the term VUCA or the acronym VUCA? No. Watch, now that I mention it, you will begin to see this. So it's V-U-C-A. It's the world that we, we live in is more volatile, V, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Meaning there's a lot more gray area than there used to be. And it is becoming more and more of a VUCA world. The acronym VUCA actually was first coined by the State Department when they were referring to specific areas of the world as a way of characterizing an area of the world that we want to be very cautious in, right? Well, now, when we explain that acronym for people, most people are like, yeah, that's kind of the world that I live in. So when we, the, the fir this first tenet of strategic acting is acting decisively even in the face of uncertainty. And for many of us, and Allison and I called you out, had a conversation earlier. That's hard for me. It's harder for me than it is for Allison. <laughs> we already figured that out, right? I see uncertainty, and I want to reduce the risk. But what we're saying is, in strategic acting, we really have to be willing to make a decision in the face of uncertainty. We need to foster agility. What does agility mean? Trish. Swift movement. Okay, swift movement. What else? Flexibility. Being flexible. Nice. Graceful. Nice. So nice. being flexible and swift movement and not being a klutz about it. Got it. <laughs> Good. And there's the hand over here. Nimble. Yeah, nimble, right? So this is, again, that theme of uncertainty. Our world, and you might think 50 years ago, the strategic planning process, if, if anybody remembers, we used to create five-year plans. <laughs> now we're lucky to get 18 months, maybe three years. But if you're doing a three-year plan, it's got to be shifted every year. So how do we be nimble or agile? And then lastly, create alignment by setting clear strategic priorities. So I heard somebody say earlier, I can't remember your name. My name? Yes. Hope. Hope. You said I have a hard time saying no. Oh, did you hear me say that? Yes. I heard you. <laughs> 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 so Who has a hard time saying no? <laughs> then you will have a very hard time honoring priorities as a leader. <clears throat> right? Because if you say we're going to take that hill and somebody brings along a great idea, you've got to be willing to say nope don't have the resource, doesn't fit with where we're headed. So to unpack these three a little bit, acting decisively, as we said, taking quick and effective action when it's needed. So really being able to recognize. This doesn't say you're, you're always shooting from the hip. But when is the situation requiring it? Making decisions that are strategically consistent with one another. What does that mean? Barbara. Well, it depends on what you mean by one another. So you can tell I'm a lawyer because I'm parsing out the sentence. But, um, Whereas, sorry. If, if you've spent all this time deciding what the strategy is going to be, the decisions have to meld in with Yeah, that. there's got to be like an internal integrity. If we said we're going to do A and B is getting in the way, there's a lack of consistency. So really being able to 
and in a sense, almost creating a filter for your decisions to say, how does this fit with everything that we're up to? And then learn from actions by deliberately reflecting on the consequences to inform future decisions. Now, what does that look like? So this actually says we take an action and it doesn't work quite right. Sharon, what would that look like if we were doing it? Um, regroup things. Be prepared to, to regroup. Reassess where you are and regroup and then be able to move forward again. Yeah, excellent. So the military uses an acronym here called uh, AAR, After Action Review. And it sounds very militaristic, but if you really take that principle, what they do to Sharon's point, is following an action, whatever that is, an operation, a mission, is to hit pause and do an after action review. And I would say there's three primary questions that are very simple. What worked? What didn't work? And what can we learn from it, right? So what do we typically do when we have a breakdown or a failure? Complain. Complain? Blame. blame. We've got to find the blame. Get defensive, right? Explain ourselves. So this is really inviting a learner mindset in terms of how we deal with this uncertainty. Because if, we're, if we are living with a knower mindset, and by the way, there's actually a lot of work done around these two mindsets by a woman named Carol Dweck out of Stanford. A learner mindset, when I... And if I can refer to our conversation again, Allison is starting up a new venture inside of your organization. When I fail, I can either justify, explain, and blame, or I can say, what can I learn from this? So one thing as a leader, particularly in a climate and an era where we have higher uncertainty, is to really uh, challenge yourself to be a learner. It doesn't mean that you have to be ignorant or not know. It just means you need to be open to the fact that there's more to learn. Any questions about that? I sort of do. Yes, yes Hope. I sort of feel, I, I feel as though we're, um, you're talking to a group of women, and in a lot of respects, these are different. These decision-making capabilities are different for women. So for example, um, when I go back in my learner mindset, mm -hmm. um, almost inevitably, mm -hmm. um, I will say to myself, what did I do wrong? It's my tone of voice. Like, for, I'm giving you just one example. Sure. Men don't like it when I say, no one can make a decision, I make a decision. You know, this is what we're going to do, and then they all come down on my voice. You know, your intonation, you know, you sound like a B-I-T-C-H, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, so I'm just saying that. I want to keep that in mind as we go forward. As we think through, because I think that our way of dealing with things and thinking and how people react to us is slightly different from the women in the I think it's very different. I would certainly acknowledge that. And I would also broaden it a little bit to say, as an individual leader, if you are trying to be a learner inside of a knower culture, it could be very challenging. So, Barbara, I don't know your firm, but in general, my stereotype is that law firms have a lot of knowers, right? Because you're getting paid to reduce, drive out the risk, and be right. So for someone to actually say, I'm not sure, we made a mistake, let's look at it. What can we learn is very countercultural. So the example you gave, Hope, is a good one. In the, the difference in gender culture, but even as a, a leader, regardless of gender, if you begin to exercise more of a learner mindset inside of a culture that is blaming and certain, uh, it can be very risky. Because people will interpret that as you are less than or inferior in some way. Versus what you're trying to do is open up right. an exploration to learn from the from the, the action, whatever it was. Okay? I want to keep moving because there's a lot. But please feel free to raise your hand and stop uh, where it makes sense. So the agility piece, just to expand that a bit, one piece of that is to facilitate others' actions 
by providing them with a balance of autonomy and direction. What does that mean? I'm, I'm walking, walking around to get my eyes on some names, Christy. What's it mean to balance autonomy and direction? What do you think? What's autonomy mean for you? <coughs> lifeline. Call. You got a lifeline. <laughs> Call it somebody. Do you have to empower the people in your team? Yeah, so you can't take control of all all the actions. You have to empower others. Great. So so I'm autonomy is I'm actually giving you authority, counting on you to get this done. I'm giving her autonomy. Versus what? Let me show you how to do this. I want you to check in with me 30 minutes, every 30 minutes. Could be micromanaging. So let's let's also a high level of direction can be needed. Micromanaging is when you're providing it when it's not needed. Anybody ever feel like they've been micromanaged? You know why? It's because you, you have a degree of autonomy and someone is giving you direction. Now, if you do not have need for a, a sense of autonomy, if I've never done the job before, if I'm brand new at it, and you don't give me direction, I'm going to be just as frustrated. Because you're asking me to do something I don't know how to do. So really finding the balance. And we're going to spend probably about 30 minutes today around that. Because it's critical for you as a leader, whether you're working with one person or a team. <coughs> so to foster agility, find ways to reward appropriate risk-taking. Notice appropriate risk-taking. Right? So what do we typically reward? We reward a job well done. We reward success, right? And if that's all we ever reward, we reward, 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 okay, whatever. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to get people being very careful to be sure they're successful, yeah. right? We'll say more about that, Trish, in your experience. You're new to the job and you want to get everything right. Uh -huh. and, uh, you see the culture says that if I don't get it exactly right, I'm going to be punished, then you're almost careful and you don't want to make steps until you are so sure, and then you miss that yeah, it's that, a mistake as well. Yeah, it's external reinforcement. And it may not even be that I'm going to be punished. It just may be I won't be successful, <laughs> right? So we, we tend to, yeah, Paul? And also sometimes it just squashes creativity and innovation. It's like, okay, well, that's not what I think they want, so let's not even go there. Yeah. That's a whole other. Yeah, we worked with a client actually many years ago, um, 15 years ago. It was a manufacturer in Cleveland who wanted more innovation from their engineering group. Now, the CEO was an ex-Marine, and in front of the corporate headquarters was the U.S. flag, and on the same flagpole just below it was the Marine Corps flag. And the CEO prided himself in his words, on making grown men cry. <laughs> he would sit in product review sessions and do nothing but send arrows and criticisms. Why what this? What's wrong with that? Why'd you do this? This doesn't make sense. And I said, wait, this is your CEO behavior, and you want your engineers to take more risk. <laughs> do I see a problem with that? So what we actually said to the head of engineering is here's your assignment. Let the CEO know what his behavior is doing to your engineer and ask him not to do it. He was like, I, 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 I said, look, no, we're not telling, we don't want him to become lovey-dovey. We don't want him to hug. We're don't, not trying to transform his life. If he wants more innovation, he must stop these behaviors. And we gave the the VP of engineering support, and they were able to pull it off. They really got their engineers to take more risk. But it's, it's enormous. You want to be agile, you've got to allow for error. And then learn from it, which is down here. Examine mistakes for the learning value, as opposed to blaming. And I would even say personally, be willing to learn lessons from your own actions. 
So what is it that allows people in the organization to take risks or be vulnerable? What's the, the most, Marilyn, what we, I guess? Freedom. Freedom. But, but what, what will tell me it's OK? See, to take the risk that, the, that there's communication that you're able to. <clears throat> How do I know it's going to be safe, David? No penalties. No penalties. The leader, see others the leader goes first. So for you as a leader to be able to say, I goofed. Boy, I made a mistake. What can we learn from this? I'm sorry I said it that way because I didn't mean it that way. Those are very, very powerful things. And I'm really speaking to you all as leaders to be able to create that space. It creates that safety. If a leader never makes a mistake, I feel like I can't either, right? OK, the third one was create alignment by setting clear strategic priorities. So implement whatever tactics consistent with the strategy. So make sure as a leader that you are, when you're actually executing the strategy, you're doing things that make sense in terms of what you've said we're up to. Manage the tension between success in the short term and success in the long term. What is that tension? <clears throat> Make money for today and, and not that's, just worry about today's. That's a great one. Yeah. That's a great one. So, so that today brings urgency. Firefighting, problem solving, short term opportunities that are going to bring money straight to the bottom line, but take resources and divert attention away from what we're doing long term. So notice this doesn't say only pursue the long term. It's manage that tension. And it's a creative tension. It's, it will always be there. So managing that creative tension. There will be times that you say, you know what, we need to take this opportunity. And acknowledge that it may be distract, distracting us from the long term, but we don't want to get distracted too long. What do we tend to do? as leaders, between the long term and the short term? What tends to win? Short, 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 short term. term, right? Whether it's driven by Wall Street or other expectations, it's got to make it happen now. More and more, we're seeing very successful companies, especially in some ways driven by the model from the Asians, of taking a very long term view and being ready to deal with less in the short term in order to be more sustainable in the long term. Easier in the private sector than it is in the public sector. And then recognize the need to adapt existing plans to changing conditions. So again, not a five-year strategic plan. And even if it's three-year, most clients that we work with have an annual refresh process to say, do we have the strategic assumptions changed? Is the market changing? OK, so this is the overview of strategic acting. So also in the book is a chapter on strategic teams. So I want to take a, a few minutes around what do we even mean by a strategic team, and then we're going to dive more into just teaming dynamics in general. So a strategic team is a team whose work has strategic implications for a particular business unit, product line, service area, functional area, division, or company. Pretty broad. And I think the key word, key words are strategic implications. So if we go back to strategic, it's long-term sustainable. So I'm just curious, who, according to this definition, who in the room would feel like they're serving on a strategic team? Let me just hear one or two. Marilyn, what, describe the team. Well, it's, um, you mean the personalities? Or no, the just function? like, what's the nature of the team? Well, they're, uh, is, uh, it, is it an executive it's team? It's management, it? it's management, it's development, it's integrators, it's customer service, it's... Wow. Wait, it's, people yeah, from all those yeah. areas? And all, yeah, because, yeah, and it's all, it's all focused on creating the experience for the user. Oh, wonderful. So you've drawn people from every yeah. place that has a user contact and put them on a team together. Yeah. 
And what's the strategic imperative? What is it they're trying to accomplish? Two more users. <laughs> oh, really trying to, to grow the user base. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Great example. So notice it's not an executive team. It's cross-functional, but there's a very clear strategic imperative. Great. Who had another one? Just so we try this on. There were, there were several hands up when I asked. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, Amy. So I, I depending on the week, um, I think the improved board functions as a strategic Absolutely. board. Absolutely. The most. Um, and we, so we have multidisciplinary directors who are trying to meet the objectives of Cruise Pop. Excellent. So really representing different perspectives, trying to work together. Certainly strategic in terms of the life and growth and sustainability of the organization. Great. Thank you. Who is on an executive team? Do you feel like that's a, a strategic team? Yeah? Colleen? Um, yeah. I mean, the, the executive team, you have the different divisions that, that are all trying to you know, ensure that their division succeeds, but then also that the company as a whole succeeds, and also trying to um, facilitate, you know, across different product lines, um, you know, some synergies. So it's it's needing to kind of foster your own division, but also foster uh -huh. the company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the executive team is is both people representing their functions, but also trying to represent the whole. Yeah. And we also represent or responsible for being champion the strategic vision of the leader, of the key person, the CEO. CEO. Right. So he brought, you know, bring the executive team together, not only to get ideas and better understand what the individuals, what we're doing in our own roles, but it's then for us to take away from that meeting what we agree to, to mm -hmm. champion it to our own various mm -hmm. divisions. Absolutely, right. To really support the leader's vision and then drive it through the organization. Yes. Excellent. Great. So before we proceed further, Lee forgot something. In your workbook, what page is that, Allison? Page six. On page six is a one-page sort of a little poll, and this comes out of the book. And, and it, it really looks at the, what we just looked at in terms of what do we mean by strategic acting, those characteristics. And so I'd like at your tables, if you would just take two minutes and fill that out for yourself. This is in terms of the aspects of strategic acting. And then we'll take, take a couple of minutes and compare notes with your neighbor. So go ahead and and help solidify those aspects of strategic acting. <laughs> okay, I can tell we're done. So what I'd like to do is invite you to turn to one other person at the table and just share either a takeaway that you got from doing that inventory, maybe it might be a place you were surprised, or a place that you feel like maybe you want to get strengthened, or it could be some place you want to acknowledge yourself for doing a good job. Now, I've noticed that every table has an odd number. So if one person from each table could find one person from another table, then we'll have, we should actually, it should actually work out beautifully. Okay, I'd like to just hear from a couple of people. First of all, I just, I, I noticed there was a lot of very vigorous conversation going on. So now I'm going to ask for someone just to share what were some of the highlights of what you saw in your conversation. I want to tell you, invariably, nobody wants to say anything. I know you guys have been busy talking. So who has something that they either noticed or they heard from their partner that they're taking away? Hope? Oh. Well, I think in general, we realize that there's improvement in every category. So we're not perfect in each category. We okay, good. Some... Absolutely. Room to grow. That would be a learner mentality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. What else? What else did you notice? Like maybe where do you feel you're, you're, you have assets or strengths? Where might you want to grow? 
Janice. Um, I, the areas that I'm weak in tend to be related, but they're, you know, if they're around decision making or taking quick action, mm. they all sort of tie. <laughs> they're connected. And so the ones that I'm better at tend to be where, you know, learning and learning from act, uh, from errors. Those are all related as strengths. So they tend to right. have strengths are together the things I want that. I don't do well. Really. That's very good. And, by the way, we all have areas that we don't do as well as other areas. So thank you for sharing. That's a great connection. So who else saw maybe some challenge in terms of, like, decisiveness, taking quick decisions? All right, good. So notice, we're not alone. Good. Who felt, hey, that's a strength of mine? Sharon, Amy, Allison, good. All right, so notice how you could support each other in terms of really developing as a leader. And, and I would recommend for your own leadership development that, and, and you are a great model, Janice, just to be really able to acknowledge this is something I'm either not good at, I'm not comfortable with, or I could get stronger at, and invest in yourself. There are ways of, of really you know, honing your learning edge. Sure. I, I just uh, just one of the things I noticed that having this assessment is uh, is really useful and just to, have to to be able to notice you know what are the areas that you're weaker in that I'm weaker in and and, and to be able to um, and make a plan and what your strengths are yes <laughs> but uh, you know just just having it there is I think really uh, important that's great just taking a pause yeah, yeah. to really yes. reflect anything else Mary no, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. So I, I would, and, and this is just how we look and think. So it, interesting, the first few comments were about where I was weak. Right? So our culture and our learning and development culture that we live in has primarily been focused on where are you weak and how do we make that stronger. Did anybody take away with, hey, here's what I'm really good at. Here's where I'm strong. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, as a female trait, well, I really yeah. think that self-deprecating component is a female trait. So we all look at what we're weak in, and then, and then when you ask us, we'll tell, us, tell you what we're strong I have a Y chromosome, <laughs> and I know that I am very, keen, or very keenly attuned to what I'm weak in and where I make mistakes. It's just men don't acknowledge it right. as, well, as easily bad. as women, right? <laughs> My organizational culture tends to focus on what you're not doing right or what you <clears throat> aren't able to do, and to penalize rather than try to grow your strengths. If you're particularly good at these three things, maybe what the organization should do is try to grow those strengths and have you focus on that rather than mm -hmm. trying to turn you into something. I mean, that's great. Which is really why, why, why it's, it's, it's kind of um, ironic that, and, and I think it's really important to talk about taking risk and encouraging risks, but really, organizations in general today do not do that at all. I mean, do not. You know, you're expected to deliver 100% to your clients and 100% accuracy. I mean, I've heard it with my clients, and we all have. And, and so, theoretically, the idea of rewarding risk is important and supporting that because innovation and creativity comes from doing that and you, you build muscle, of course, mm -hmm. by, by, by doing things that you haven't done before. But really, in this, what did you call the world? VUCA world? VUCA. VUCA. VUCA world? In the VUCA world, there's like very little room for that. Well, in the VUCA world, I, you cannot survive operating with no risk. You really, you cannot, because the world's changing too fast. It's too uncertain. Does anybody in the room work for an organization that feels a little different than what Sharon is describing? I'm just curious. I have like, a question. Like where, like where mistakes are not viewed as failures as much as learning opportunities. Marilyn? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. We strive for that. I strive for that in my own company. Always. Yeah. Yeah. And we were talking about that, like, you know, let's talk about this so as lessons learned versus you did something wrong. 
but it's hard for people to take it in that way. Well, it's, we're, we're, it's, it's not even just business culture. Somebody said earlier, you know, we, Amy, I think, said we tend to look at what's wrong or what's weak. All of us do that, right? When, even like my grandchildren, they get more attention for what they do wrong yes. than what they do right, mm -hmm. right? And that means we have to train ourselves as leaders to be acknowledging great effort. You didn't get it that time. Let's try again, right? That's it's just the very same behavior whether you're raising a child or an employee, and I'm not being demeaning to employees. The science is saying it's very similar. Now, if I want to empower and grow my child, I want to empower and grow my employee. Um, I, had a, the, I had an employee tell me yesterday, you don't have to thank me for what I'm doing, because this is my job. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, I do have to thank you. I want to thank you. Oh. So that is. <laughs> and I, I, I had a client about 10 years ago. We said to them, you need to acknowledge your people when they're doing their job well. And he, he just could, it did not compute for him. You want me to spend time telling people they're doing their job? I said, absolutely. Because you will get more of what you pay attention to. Yeah. If you're only telling them when there's a breakdown, that you will increase their, their fear and there will be more breakdowns. Yeah. <laughs> so, Sharon, it, it is sort of the culture that we live in, and there's something for each of us as leaders to create the space for people. We are not advocating that people make mistakes. You're not saying, go out there and fail. No. <laughs> but when they do, create a space where they can learn and the organization can get stronger because of it. What's the difference, though, between encouraging them to take risks and uh, the risk versus the mistake? I don't see how they're well, not necessarily... Well, if you encourage me to take risks, you have to allow for the possibility of mistakes. Those two are tightly coupled. Okay. If I take, if I, if I am going to do something that feels <coughs> awkward or uncertain, which is risk, then the chances of mistake are much higher. If my culture is telling me you cannot make a mistake, I will not take that <coughs> risk. So the two are just tightly coupled. Now, you may work in a business that is very stable, that hasn't changed in years. I have a client who runs hydroelectric dams. They don't change a lot. I mean, the technology doesn't change. You don't want a whole lot of change in that industry. But if you're in financial services or have a customer interface, I mean, things are changing. One more comment, and then I, we need to move. Yeah. For my company, we have to do risk assessments on each file that we work on. <clears throat> and so we're given autonomy in that risk assessment. And as long as you back that up, uh, you have something in writing that's why you took that risk, you're usually OK with it. Mm -hmm. It's when your risk, you know, your assessment is poorly written or non-existent. Mm -hmm. That's when you get in trouble. So. I think having a reasoning behind yeah. the risk. And that's that, that, that's that phrase, appropriate risk. Right? Appropriate and risk. you may even institute in your culture, when, you, when you're not going to follow procedure, you need to be in communication with somebody. Right? right. It's just right. like you can't unilaterally go decide to do something completely differently. That is not an appropriate risk. Right. right? right. You, so you, may not, you, you may not give a, an 80% discount to a customer. That is not an appropriate risk. Unless we all get behind it with you. Right. Right. Yeah. So I think that's sort of a difference, too, is can you analyze or write down why you took that risk versus just, oh, I just took it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because in the, in the after action review, that's where you talk about. So why did you do that? What, was your, what were your drivers? What will you do next? What, how can we learn from this? Really, it's, it's the, the impetus is learning. It's, it's the difference between a learning organization and one that does not really encourage learning from their people. So I want to move back to teams. And just a couple things. Number one, the, those of you who are in executive teams, Colleen, you said you were. The book says, and I agree from our professional opinion, there are challenges for teams at the top. For one thing, in that tension between I'm representing operations, or I'm representing finance, or I'm representing marketing, and working for the good of the whole, which one do I usually have the greatest allegiance to? My own, you know, at the top. So um, 
creating that meaningful, concrete, shared purpose for someone at the top is difficult because they're usually driven by how they're rewarded or their area being most successful. And also creating tangible performance goals. Believe it or not, everybody knows what a SMART goal is? Yes. Doesn't mean a dumb goal. It's not the opposite <laughs> of a dumb goal. It's a specific, measurable, attainable, realist, you know, time bound. Working with executive teams, getting them to actually articulate specific, measurable goals is incredibly difficult. We need to drive sales up. Specifically, what are you trying to accomplish? Even at executive levels, getting people to both specify and commit to goals is really challenging. The members are typically chosen by their position, as Colleen said, right, the head of each group, rather than their strengths or what they're bringing to the team. So you may not have the complementary strengths that you need on the team. The time commitment is too high. There's very little patience for team development. At an executive level, and countless articles on this, executive teams do not spend enough time together. They come together, they report status, they go back and manage their groups. There is no sense of team. And that takes time for people to build relationship together. And then lastly, perhaps most importantly, mutual accountability is a challenge. Like really having executives be able to hold each other accountable versus asking the CEO to do it, but to say, wait a minute, we said we were going to do this and you're not. That's a real challenge when egos get high. They're very used to hierarchy and their own swim lanes. So what we want to do to create a team at the top is ensure that that strategy making work is really defined as a collective work product. This is something we all own. Uh, shift the leadership role based on strengths. So some people think the team lead is therefore the one who runs the meetings. Maybe there's a member of the team that has a particular skill around managing conversations and they ought to run the meetings. So you shift the leadership based on what people can contribute. Sometimes on a leadership team, I've seen this before, one person has the heart. Like, they're keenly aware of how the organization will be impacted if we do certain things, but they're not given a voice for that. Like, that's a, that's a key strength that has to be brought into the table. So rather than really leveraging those strengths, executives at the top tend to rely on the CEO and report out on their own individual <coughs> areas versus acting as a team. And then building mutual accountability, as I said. So what this then begs is, well, what does it take to be a team? What do we mean by team? So the, for the balance of this session, I really want to talk about not just teams at the top, but like what, what is a team? Because in my, I, I've worked with dozens at least, if not scores of executive teams, and I can count on one hand the number of who exhibited the, the, the characteristics of a team when we first started working with them. They're typically working groups. Team is different. So a team is a small number of people with complementary skills who are committed to a common purpose, performance goals, and approach for which they hold themselves mutually accountable. Now, what does that mean? So a small number of people. It's not specified. What, what do you think a, a good range for a team would be? Eight to 12. Eight to 12. 12 is pushing it. I would probably say like six to eight, maybe 10 is a max. Why? Why is that important? Easier to manage. Easier to manage. Good. So you more personality types. If you have one of each, you're probably pretty good. I don't know how many personality types, but <laughs> a lot of different personalities at the table. Right. Everyone needs to have a voice. Yes. Yeah. Too, right. too, too many, many people. Yes. Many exactly. Ideas. You can't, you cannot, it's not a small group. It, it's you can't work effectively when you get past eight or ten. We've worked with teams of 11 or 12. You end up with multiple sub teams. It just happens. It's the nature of human dynamics. So a key thing is keep it small enough that you can be intimate. Intimate as in 
we get to know each other. We build relationships. Can't do that in a group of 12. It will not happen. We've watched it. You know, CEOs said, oh, no, we'll make it work. No, it won't work. <laughs> Complementary skills. Why is that important? Different perspectives. Different perspectives. Yeah, Everybody's got strengths to our conversation earlier. There are people in this room with strengths that show up as challenges for other people. When you're on a team, you can leverage each other. So it may be perspectives. It may be specific, concrete skills. It may be gender differences. It may be eth not ethnic differences. Lots of differences. And more and more studies are showing the more difference, well-managed, the better the result. The other thing that I would say about that is if you have too large of a team, you aren't, you're going to get some overload on a particular skill, and those people are going to take over. Absolutely. You can so get, and when you get that kind of concentration, we actually like to use the word inertia, like you mm -hmm. get stuck. Mm -hmm. It could even be just a style where lots of fact, we call fact-finding energy, right? Like we get stuck in analysis paralysis. <laughs> so being, being aware of the diversity and being open to the differences and leveraging the differences. Committed to a common purpose, performance goals, and approach. So there's three things in that list. And I'm just going to check my time. There are purpose is why. Some companies don't have a real distinctively articulated why. Why are we even doing this? And why is interesting. I mean, it's, is it necessary? Maybe not. What's the good of having a clear purpose as a team or an organization? Something to work Buy towards. It. Something to work toward. It's a higher purpose that we're all striving to. It's something that we can all feel connected to. And it's actually. Evaluate, then you're approaches or your strategies against whether it's It creates the context, outcome. right? Or the container inside yeah. of which it can help make decisions. <laughs> Wait a minute, if this is our purpose, why are we doing that? Right? It's also a great combination of head and heart. Brings fulfillment. Brings fulfillment. Purpose has an emotional component to it. And can also create a great filter for who even comes on the team. Yeah. Do they share that purpose? Performance goals, that's the what. So purpose is the why. Performance goals is the what. How do we know we're successful? What is it we're trying to accomplish? The approach is the how. So approach is a very broad term, but it's how we work together. So what are examples of approaches? It goes into approach. Behaviors. Behaviors, values. So the values of an organization and the behaviors that are associated with them? Culture. Culture. And honestly, if we just get nitty gritty, procedures. Are systems. Systems, procedures, process. That is all part of how. So for a team, we want to have a shared commitment to why are we doing this, how will we know we're successful, and how do we work together. For which they hold themselves mutually accountable. So what does that look like? I said it's difficult for senior teams, but what does it look like when we hold ourselves mutually accountable? I want to hear from someone I haven't heard from. Melissa! <laughs> I'm coming for you. <laughs> um, I think that when team members hold themselves, hold each other mutually accountable, it means that you have as much, I'm counting on you as much as you're counting on me. That's great. You know, we're both, we're in this together, we're going to win together, we're going to lose together, but we're on this ledge together. That's excellent. So, if we have this shared commitment, and I love your use of the word count on, right? So, count uh, accountable, you can also think as count onable, right? Can I count on you? So, so we have this commitment here, and whatever you did is kind of derailing us, so... I have to have a conversation with you. Why? Because I'm committed to that the same as you are. Right? So we actually hold each other up, but we also challenge each other. Great. This is what it looks like when we're team. So a group of people who meet periodically but have very different accountabilities, 
not a team. So if you're ever like finding yourself complaining over that glass of, of wine that our, our team isn't working like a team, it's because they're not. <laughs> they don't have clear purpose. They don't have shared goals. They're not clarity around how are we going to work together. And then the courage to actually have conversations when we're not. So I included this in the packet. Who's read The Five Dysfunctions of a Team? Anybody? You're nodding. Yes? Highlights. Okay. So this is just recommended reading. It's by a guy named Pat Lencioni. It is a short... Um, have you read it? Yeah, not as you mentioned once she said it. It's a short story form. So it's about a leader and her team and hope. It's a woman leader. Yay. Yeah. Yay. And the sort of the learning that she goes through and that the team goes through in building themselves to a higher level of performance. And these are the building blocks, if you will, that are sort of uncovered through the story. Now it's called the five, the book is called the five dysfunctions of a team because it's, it's framed in terms of when these are missing, it's a dysfunction. We like to frame it more positively. So what's the bottom of that pyramid? Trust. Trust. Trust is the foundation for a team. If I don't trust, and by trust, what I mean is it feels, somebody used the word earlier, it feels safe. It feels safe to make a mistake. It feels safe to express my opinion. It feels safe to disagree with what's been said. If I trust, then I will have, you will have conflict. You will have constructive conflict. Is conflict good or bad? Conflict, yes, conflict is good and bad. I mean, but without conflict, a team cannot develop. So it is not bad in the sense that when I see conflict, I should be concerned. It's when I see conflict, I should help it to occur constructively. Now, why is it important that there be conflict on a team? Olivia. Because it means that people are questioning each other's ideas. Yeah, it means you're actually bringing what you have to the table. If we have complementary skills and perspectives, how can there not be conflict? Mm -hmm. It's it, brainstorming. Brainstorming. It, and it can be as trivial as, I have a child in daycare, and if I'm there after 6 o'clock, it's 30 bucks, right? But if I don't trust that I can actually say that, I'm going to sit in the meeting until 6.30 and get angry at everybody else in the meeting because I haven't expressed what feels like a conflict for me, right? Now, so by when I have conflict, when I'm able to express that, <clears throat> You know, I just have to say, I, I can't stay till after 5.45. Is there a way that I can catch up? Oh, yeah, sure. You know, we'll give you the minutes. You get yourself out of here. Will I be more committed or less to the work of the team? More committed. Right? So, and by the way, there may be conflicts where I don't get my way. But if I know I can voice it and be heard, my commitment will increase. If I'm afraid, afraid that it's not safe, what level of commitment will I have? You'll have what the, what the surveys are telling us, you'll have about a 30% commitment from your employees. Across the board, about 30%, you have about, we, we collectively have about a 30% engagement level from our employees in this country. 70% of their hearts and minds are somewhere else. And it's because they don't feel safe enough to actually bring themselves to work, to have the constructive conversations, to be able to say, I'm still in. Because if I can't engage in conflict, I'm going to withhold it and be semi-committed. But once I get to that level of commitment, then I can begin to share that accountability that Melissa was talking about, where yes, you can count on me. I, I, I feel like an owner, and my results are going to be, my focus is going to be on shared results. If my focus is not on shared results, where is it? 
It's on me. It's on taking care of me. Right? So I'm not going to go deeper into this, but it's, a, it's, it's a, in the back of the workbook or all the citations. This is like a must read for any leader, just to give you a kind of a visceral sense of what these dynamics feel like. Tasha? I actually read this um, previously, and I must say, it brought out a lot of tension, especially when it came down to the trust part, because all the groups felt one group were, were not necessarily dishonest, but they didn't trust the product that they were responsible for producing. And it just set off a, a huge debate. Mm. Um, so it opened up a conversation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, it wasn't nice. Oh, where, mm -hmm. And then everyone had one, one group had started, you know, said it, all the others chimed in. Mm. And so that particular um, department had had no idea what others felt about them. And they also felt that in times where um, he or she was wrong, they never admitted it. Sure. Which made the problem even worse. And it, helped, it didn't help them, it didn't help the other departments so, complete their job. So you had a, you kind of unleashed a lot of conflict. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not suggesting you use the book as a weapon. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's a great framework for understanding the dynamics of a team, especially if you're leading a team. So, so just one, one question. So when you, when you say conflict, it's not, I, I, what I'm understanding is that what you need is to have a safe mechanism for resolving conflict. Is that, is that what it is? Or? Well, I'm using the word conflict very broadly, probably to mean differences. So if it feels, if I feel like I can trust the environment, and as a leader, we have a lot to do with creating that, right? Then I will, I will be more self-expressed. I will say, if everybody else in the room says something's blue and I see yellow, do I sit there quietly and say, well, I guess they're right? No, I feel safe enough to be able to say, I don't know why, but I see yellow. Can we talk about this further? That's actually conflict, right? It's not, it's not emotional, it's not blaming, it's just a difference. Um, many, and we've worked with teams where 11 out of 12 people are like in this direction and the 12th is in this direction. Thank you, now, sorry. what typically happens in that scenario? What does this 12th person typically do? Shut up. Shut up. You just, you're just like, oh, okay, fine. We'll be, we'll be fine, right? A hunter. That's other than a jury, right? right. <laughs> well, or, or we zip it. We just, we like, okay, you know, it's not worth fighting for. We concede. So there's no, there's no apparent conflict. There's, overt, there's covert conflict. What you want, and by the way, the, the, the 12th person is the one who saw the iceberg. So do you want that person to shut up? Or do you want that person to say, I'm not sure if I'm saying it wrong, but I got to tell you what I'm seeing. And we've, we actually did have one example where that 12th person moved the rest of the group. And it's, it's, it's a moving experience to see, but it requires the other 11 to be learners, to be able to say, okay, I, I don't get it. It's going to take more. Because the other 11, what are they thinking? Oh, we're done. Come on, it's time to go home. Why are we still talking about this? Right? But there's that moment of truth. So that's, that's what this, this is about. Allowing, allowing us to hear each other's experience so that we can come up with the best result. There's a hand over Well, I, I think you said earlier when you were talking about the elements of a successful team that there needed to be a balance between, a, you know, a creative tension, if you will. And I view conflict pretty much as that creative tension. Um, it's not so much black or white, but it's That's that great. tension that yeah. could yeah. help you look yeah. at and, both and, sides. And we, we use conflict, generally speaking, when you say the word conflict, positive or negative? Negative. Yeah, as a culture, we view po negative, right? So I, I think I'm right. In the, in the Chinese language, there are two characters in their character set for the word crisis. And one of them means danger, and the other one means opportunity. So there's, a, there's, a, there's that tension, right? Every conflict is an opportunity. It's a crucible where something else could happen. But if we treat it as negative, we suppress it, 
And then we create an environment where there's no trust that I can actually be different or say something other than the parking lot. It's very much connected to, you know, just what we were talking about before, that idea of enabling risk and being comfortable with that in our culture. Yeah. That doesn't have this, a lot of room for that. So uh, uh, if your organization says, I want more innovation, then that means you need to allow more risk. That means you need to figure out how to build a tolerance or even a celebration of conflict. Not, not negative, dramatic conflict, but wow, okay, that's different. Let's hear about that. So this is a little different approach. This is uh, the stages of team development. This is a very old model. Who's familiar with this? I'm constantly amazed. Ho I mean, Janice, you, you are, yeah. This was developed by a guy named Bruce Tuckman in 1965. And it, is, it explains so much. Teams are not born ready. They develop over time. And so there are two dimensions. There's a task dimension and a relationship dimension. And I'm going to actually start being a fire hose here because we're running out of time. But bear with me. As teams develop, the first stage is called forming. Bring the new team together. From a task perspective, it's getting people's commitment to what is it we're accountable for. From a relationship perspective, relationship to each other, but also relationship to the work itself, how, how am I going to fit in? What's it mean to be included here? Right? So in the forming stage, there's a high need for clarity in terms of task. What's our mission? What's our purpose? How are we going to work together? All of that. People are like hungry. What does this mean? How do I fit in? How do I be successful? What it looks and feels like in the forming stage is relatively quiet. Because people are like, is it safe? i got to figure out the rules of the road. How do I fit in here? Right? And we've all been there. You know, It's like when you walk into a networking or event or a cocktail party and you just assume everybody in there knows each other, mm -hmm. right? No, no, we're all forming together. That's the forming stage. And as we continue to work together, we hit the storming stage. Now notice on the task dimension, it's called clarification. So, yep, you got me my, our marching orders. It's real clear what we're supposed to do. We begin to work together, and I didn't know I was going to have to work in Maryland. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> or or I, I thought I knew how to do this, but you guys do it different than I did at the other place. So it's, you know, this is like the honeymoon's over. All the, the blush is off the rose. <laughs> this is harder than I thought it was going to be. From a relationship point of view, it's, I don't know if I belong. I don't know if I fit in. Right? So... It's called storming because this is where, and Sharon, back to your point about conflict, this is where conflict naturally begins to emerge. Our difference, we have differences that are suppressed here. Why? Because we all basically want to look good and fit in. We'll be polite. But there's an end to that. And that's when the storming begins. And storming is not, it's called storming, it sounds negative. In Florida right now, we would think that's negative. Um, what it means is just allowing differences to emerge. Now, if we're successful at storming, we move to the norming stage. What do you think that means? Getting in the groove. Getting in the groove. What's a norm? Normal. Standardized. Normal, standardized, agreed upon ways of doing things, right? So the storming is, you know, Marilyn, you do it that way. I do it this way. You ought to do it this way. And Marilyn says, no, you ought to do it this way, right? But at some point, we open up and say, you know what? We, we got to have a common way. And you know what? I can give on this and you can give on that. That's conflict, but it's healthy. And we end up with a norm. Okay, well, then this is the way we're going to do it. So when we talked about those commitments to shared and a shared approach as a team, that's norms. And we all live with lots and lots of norms. 
the way we dress, the way we drive, the way we speak. There are norms. And you know when you have a norm when somebody violates it. It's like, oh, we don't do that. No, that's not the way we do it. Right? So, forming, storming, norming. And at this point, so Marilyn, you and I went through that little tete-a-tete -tete here. And we developed, okay, here's how we're going to do it, right? That took us both being actively involved. And now, I actually feel like I know what to count on from you. Right? So now there's this sense of mutual support. It may sound counterintuitive, but getting through a storm together constructively leads to stronger relationships. What do we typically do when we hit a storm? We run. We run. <laughs> yeah, metaphorically, we shut down. We say, oh, that's uncomfortable. Well, I'm not having that conversation. Uh uh And where do we end up going? We're back down. In the bunker. In the bunker. <laughs> so forming stage is very polite. We're, we're putting on our best front, but not really being fully authentic. So it really, this is kind of the crucible for teams, to be able to, to trust enough to, to not blame or accuse, but to say, hey, this is what I see. Can we have a conversation about it? As we have more norms in place, we get to the level of high performing really feeling a level of task achievement and real pride around it. And the best teams, if you even reflect on the teams that you've been on that felt or you felt pride about what you accomplished, you, the norms were, you know, it's like you could wink and people would know what you were doing. People would anticipate, right, because they know your needs. So this is how teams develop. So I want to now tell you as leaders what you should do to help a team develop. Okay? Everybody put on your leader hat. And check my time. All right. So who's heard of situational leadership? Chris, you've heard of everything. No, I'm just I'm, I'm nodding and agreeing okay, with good. what you're saying. All right, good. So situational leadership, I didn't see too many hands go up. All right, good was developed, you got yours, Mary? Was that your hand up? No? No? Oh, you're not Mary. Sorry, wrong name. Kathy. Kathy, sorry. Did I see your hand go up? Yeah. Okay. So, so situational leadership was developed by a guy named Ken Blanchard, and his co-author's name was Hersey. Um, and it, it suggested that as a leader, historically, way back, and if you get in the way back machine of like management science, the leader had a style and everybody had to learn to work with the leader. Well, that's Joe, and let me tell you about how you work with Joe, right? It's almost like the leader had no responsibility to matter. Well, then it got a little bit enlightened and the leader was then determined the, the leader may need to lead and did with different styles depending on the person. So Olivia may need a little different style than Allison. So as a leader, now I have some development to do. Situational leadership took that one step further. Not only do I need to lead Olivia or Allison differently, but I may need to lead them differently depending on the situation or the task that we're working on. So there are two elements to leading in this manner. Number one is, to first assess the readiness of someone and then apply the appropriate leadership style. So remember we said earlier, direction and autonomy. If someone has a great deal of autonomy, I should probably use a different style than if they're new at something. And this same approach works for teams as well as for individual relationships. So, when we had our team development, uh, the stages of team development, think of this as forming, storming, norming, and performing. We're going to call them readiness levels one, two, three, and four. And by readiness, I mean a team's readiness to engage in what you're asking them about. So there are two elements to anyone's readiness to do something. 
One of them is the task dimension. And the term we'll use for that is competence. So competence, what do you think we mean by competence? Trish. I did not move my head. No, at you all. didn't. No, you were just you were you were just like a stone looking at me. What do you think competence means? Their ability to do something or to perform. Ability, right. So it may have to do with their skills, their knowledge. Training, do they have the information they need? Very task related, right? So, competency. As we develop as a team, we start with low competence. Any team, I don't know, sorry, I'll bring my Y chromosome into the room. <laughs> if you watched any NFL football this week, you saw a lot of incompetence. Yes. <laughs> These teams, essentially spend the preseason keeping all of their starters from getting hurt. And then they put them on the field week one, and they don't look like a team. So any team starting out, even if you have high performers, has a relatively low level of competence for, for the task at hand. As they work together through that forming stage, they develop from low to some competence, moderate to high competence, to eventually high competence. That's just a natural learning. Most of us as human beings move in that direction. If we don't, there may be something we want to look at. <laughs> right? I mean, as you do anything over time, you get naturally better at it. But this is competence. The other dimension of readiness we call relationship. And the term we're going to use is commitment. Now, not the same word as we did with commitment on the five dysfunctions, but by commitment, we mean kind of the heart level or emotional commitment to the work. So you could substitute words like motivation or confidence or will, right? This is more about skill. This is more about will. And this is the overlooked component at times because we think, well, he or she knows what to do. Why are they doing it? Well, because there's something about our commitment, our confidence that might get in the way. So when teams begin, the commitment level is high. If you think about it, most of us showing up for a brand new team, we're like, yeah, we're going to make this work. We start working together. The honeymoon's over. We figure out what it's really going to take, how we're going to have to work together, the hours or the skills or whatever, and our commitment level plummets. The honeymoon's over. It's just not as fun anymore. Then, as you work through that, and remember, this is that storming phase. So we work through that. Our commitment level begins to build. Remember, when Marilyn and I created that norm together, we actually felt better about each other and what we were counting on each other for by the time we got here. And as you get more norms in place, your commitment level is high. So this is a great way of portraying what a team needs at any given stage of its development. Any questions about this? A couple of highlights. Number one, which we already covered, competence increases gradually and incrementally over time. It is a, an upward bound curve. Commitment does not. Commitment typically has a drop as a team develops and then begins to go up. And honestly, commitment can drop like that. What can cause commitment for a team to drop? Allison, you're nodding. What can cause that? I think that the buy-in kind of, if, if they're being listened to, they might be more committed. And if they feel like their words aren't being heard, they're going to be less committed. Or if they feel so like certainly whether that what they are contributing is being honored or respected. But even the environment of the team. So the team's coming together, really starting to work, really beginning to gain competence and, and commitment. And then the scope changes. Or the deadline changes. Or the leader changes. Yeah. Or team members leave and new team members come on. Right? It's VUCA. It's a dynamic environment. When that happens, competency usually doesn't really take a hit. 
but commitment level will. So the key thing about commitment as a leader is to be overtly monitoring it. What's the climate? What's the feel of the team here? Okay? So here's the, here's the uh, Blanchard model for your leadership style. And there are the two dimensions we just mentioned. There's a task dimension, which we'll call directive behavior. And there's the relationship dimension, which we'll call supportive behavior. Now, what is directive behavior? Give me examples of that. Do this, do that. Do this, do that. Excellent. That's exactly right. Nothing wrong with directive behavior. The term micromanaging has somehow had us believe that directive behavior is bad. If a team needs guidance, directive behavior is exactly what they need. So it's any, any kind of behavior that helps provide direction, task-related direction. Supportive behavior, what's that? Great job. Sorry? Great job. It could be a really acknowledging their accomplishments. It could be listening. Listening is one of the most supportive behaviors in the world. It could be backup, you know, if, if things aren't going... Getting them, way, getting them the resources they need, getting them the backup, so responding to what they need, absolutely. So, when they are informing, that's the red number, readiness level one, we call this directive behavior. High directive, directing behavior. High directive, low supportive. It's over here. High directive... Low supportive. Low supportive does not mean disrespect. It does not mean that I'm doing anything negative. It just means I'm not exerting much effort at worrying about building them up. Why? Because in this stage, they're ready to go. But they don't know squat about what they're trying to do. So they need direction, right? So this is, this is when directive behavior is actually appropriate. And for some of you, it may not be a strength, right? You may actually, all of us, like, I, there are people who are more introverted, who are uncomfortable giving direction. So this is something to pay attention to. Early team formation needs direction. So that's either your growth or else opting someone else in that can help provide that direction. As they develop and they get into storming, what the, the style that we need we call coaching. Now that's still high directive because the team's competency hasn't developed yet, but it's also high supportive. Why? Because I know conflicts are, need to arise. I know I'm gonna have to support this team. And your job as a leader is to actually help conflict emerge constructively. Not to shut it down, not to ignore it, and also not to solve it. Anybody in here? I mean, that, there's a rescuing part of us as leaders. When somebody's having a problem, I figure, oh, I'll just, I'll just handle it for them. That actually prevents the team from developing. As they move further, what's happening? Their competence is now higher. And their, commi and their commitment level is beginning to move up. So I now have low directive. This is, this is when you feel micromanaged, it's because somebody has continued to give high direction when your competency has come up. But I'm still going to keep that supportive up because this team isn't quite where it needs to be yet. Until so finally, I get to delegating. And delegating is low directive and low supportive. This does not mean you abandon the team. It means you do delegate and trust them. You're there for course corrections to alert them to changes in the environment, but you're not giving them the direction and day-to-day -day attention, right? So they still feel your support, mm -hmm. but you're allowing them to be more autonomous. This is the balance of autonomy and direction that we talked about earlier. Any questions? I know this is a fire hose. I, it would Jen. be interesting to me to talk about a circumstance where um, people's commitment is suffering because there's been so much change on the project and what you might do as a team to recreate the commitment or 
be able because change is pretty common. I'm so I just want to repeat so people hear. You're talking about an example where lots of change on a project has reduced people's commitment. Like the, so the circumstances you were talking about, scope changed. Right. Maybe the goal has changed. Maybe a couple of team members have left and everybody feels it less cohesive as a group. And mm -hmm. what, what would you do? So what, what I would, would suggest, and, th and this you have, it just brings the two models together. What I would say is to acknowledge that we need to go back to forming. So in other words, things have changed. Let's not pretend they haven't. Let's come back to forming and really reassess. Are our roles correct? Do we need to go fight about scope because what they're asking for just is clearly impossible, right? But really kind of redefine the scope. And so it's, there's nothing wrong with coming back down this learning curve when things change. In a sense, whether you want to or not, you're going to because the, the dynamics have changed that much. So resetting direction for a means that you can operate more effectively. Because what I suspect is that oftentimes we're trying to continue out here without being honest or authentic about what's actually happened. I think it's pretty common. I, I would, I would right bet it's common. Life, yeah. And I think it's also yeah, it's symptomatic of not feeling the safety to be able to say, time out. Let's kind of re rejigger this thing because yeah, it's not working. Some people will be bitching, like, we can't do this, this is impossible, we're not going to be successful. Yeah. Right. And, then you and, the, and the, the beauty, <laughs> the beauty and, 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 and misfortune is that that team probably now has greater wisdom that it can include when it reboots to make sure that it's, it's weaving that learning back into the process. So, um, I know we're approaching 1.30, and I just want to let you know, this is at the end of your workbook. Uh, I'm, and I didn't cite it because I have no idea where I got it. <laughs> I got it like 15 years ago. But this portrays everything that we've just talked about. These columns are team readiness. And these are the four stages of team development. And in each of the cells, there's a description of what you might expect to find in that team. So, for an example, team, a team forming, the climate will feel cautious with suppressed feelings and very low conflict. Like, that's what it feels like to be in forming. Um, what does it look like in storming, subgrouping, overt or covert criticism and disagreement? Now, these two columns are your role as a leader. We've got task and relationship. So it's very high level, but at the task level, at forming, what should I be doing? So Janice, to your point, if, if the project is reforming, I need to redefine the purpose, assess our readiness, really look at goals, and help people get oriented and feel accepted in order to move to the next one. So this is just a really useful roadmap. So we have four minutes. People are packing up. Yeah, we can talk forever. This is great. Well, I'm also, I'll be responsible for not managing the time quite right. If you can stay for just a minute on page 15, you're not going to have time for a paired share, but you could use this to really reflect for yourself. From your own team's point of view, where are they? And it's really two questions. What's their competency level? for what they're being asked to do, and what's their commitment level. And this is a great tool to use for what, what you see there. And then secondly, what's your leadership style, or what are you doing? Um, most of us have a default. I, I tend to resist too much direction. I'm pretty strong in support. There's times that's probably not what my team needs, right? So just kind of use this as a way of looking at your own but your own strengths and habits as a leader. And by the way, opting other people into a certain role if you don't have what it takes. I had a client recently say, I'm just really not good at direction. I said, well, do you have a strong team lead under you? And she said, yeah. I said, empower them. Nothing wrong with that. You're still the, you know, the leader of the team. So two minutes left. 
Um, and there's also a strategic action plan, if you would like to make this for yourself. And so is there anything to say, and I, I also encourage you, please fill out the evaluations that were at your place study. Um, anything to say to be complete with the session? I know we're sort of running up against the end. I'm very good. Good. Thank you, Trish. Any takeaways? <coughs> I was going to say, I think this is a really wonderful model and a yeah. really interesting yeah. way to look at breaking down the, the skills that we, we bring forward as leaders and also how to evaluate the team and, and where the team is in its, in its development. So Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And from my experience, I've, I've enjoyed it because it kind of demystifies it a little bit. Very much. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like a mechanics to it, yeah. If, yeah. If, if we get oh, familiar with it. Yeah. Oh? Well, I was just going to say, I thought we should apply it to our Professional Leadership Development Committee. I was thinking um, about that, too. You were. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Good. The committee that created all this. Oh, yeah. Good. <laughs> Good. Next yeah. meeting, full we'll service. So, Anna? Thank you for providing all the tools. Oh, you're very welcome. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, and I encourage you that the references are very good for your own development. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yep, thank okay. you very much. Thank you.